church so you know we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, they're, they're excited to be here with us and uh, be, be up here so uh, keep praying so I uh, would appreciate that um, a couple of announcements we want to make uh, known today or minor family promise starts today what a privilege that is to get to serve uh, the families that will be coming to us today so after service uh, we're going to have our special guest she's got a table set up with some really cool stuff uh, from their ministry, and I'll have her come up in a moment and share about that. And then the crew that's uh, set up to volunteer to help set up for Family Promise, we'll get after it and get things taken care of for that. So with no more to say, I want to invite Patty Griffiths to come up. Patty Griffiths is a, a newer friend in the last three years, but a fellow Iowan, which is really cool, because we, we met at the uh, LCMC gathering, National Gathering in Ohio, almost three years ago now. Wow. And, uh, yeah, the Iowa thing was always a great connection, so we could <laughs> find another Iowa. But the ministry sh that the Lord has called her to is even more exciting, maybe, than Iowa. Maybe. It's, it's <laughs> really. But, um, and then we got to touch base with her again last year when we went back to the gathering in Lakeville, Minnesota. Uh, Karen and Jolene and others. Uh, Shelly was part of that first group that went, and Mary Cockrum. So, I mean, she's got a few friendly faces here already, and many more now that she's being here today. But wanted to have her come as they're passing through. Her husband, Jeff, is with her as well. 
And uh, so uh, we want to hear about what God's doing, and so I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, and I bring greetings from Harbor of Joy Lutheran Church in Milford, Iowa, and also from our friends in Christ in Bagoonie. Um, and I'm going to tell you about my wow in Tanzania, East Africa, and uh, Arusha is the second largest city in Tanzania on the northeast side of Tanzania, and then a village called Mbaguni that's about an hour from Arusha, depending on the road, if you've ever been to Africa. They call it the African Massage, because you go like this. <laughs> um, so I went to Tanzania in 2012, never expecting to go to Africa again, but God had other plans for me. And six months later, I was on an airplane to the Kilimanjaro Airport again, and I, the first time there, it was an amazing trip, and I met a young man, Lawrence. I claim him as my son now. And he, the second time, he asked me, would you be willing to start a Christian vocational training center in Baguni? And I had seen enough already. This young girl, Amina, she um, lived across the road from the gate at the orphanage I was staying at. She was 18 months old, and she was too big to be tied to her mama's back and work out in the fields. So she was home alone. I wondered, does she eat the dirt in the road when she gets hungry? Does she drink the water in the creek behind her house when she's thirsty? What does she do all day? And so I had to tell Lawrence, yes, I was willing to do this. What did I know about vocational training centers? Zero. What did I know about Africa? Zero. But I think God chose me because I knew nothing. And you know, I've noticed in the Bible, he always encounters people when they're doing their everyday normal things. When the Samaritan woman went to the well, it's what she did on a daily basis. When Paul was walking down the road to, Emmaus, or to Damascus, that's what he did on a daily basis. I was just going on a mission trip, and he decided to call me. So after he asked me, I went home and I Googled, how do you start a nonprofit organization? And that's how we got to Next Life Foundation. And we have two boards, one in Tanzania and one in America. The Tanzanians, they figure out what to do in Tanzania, because us Americans would really mess it up. <laughs> we basically um, raise money, and we they send us their expense reports, their budget, we com converse a lot and, and figure things out, but they do a really good job knowing how Tanzania works. We have carpentry classes, no electricity, so they become quite buff working those hand tools. And then we also have tailoring classes, so they use the treadle sewing machines and they do beautiful work. Um, no patterns, no pins, they use chalk to draw what they're going to, to make. I don't spend as much time with the carpentry guys, so I don't understand that quite as well. Um, every morning, they have morning glory, and every day before they leave school, they have evening glory. Those are what we would call devotions. And on Friday, a pastor comes, and they call it devotions. We would call it an all-out worship service. But no, no students are required, because many of our students are Muslim. But often when I'm there, they're all there. Um, I want to tell you about Zahara. She's the one in red leading the morning glory there. Um, before she came to Next Life, she was contemplating suicide because there aren't any opportunities. There's no jobs. There's really nothing. Um, after seventh grade, you take a national test. If you don't pass, you can't even consider going on to school. If you do pass, you have to have money. And when you make a dollar a day, you have no money except for maybe food. And she got accepted into our program. We take the neediest of the needy, and they don't have to pay anything to come to our school. And um, she started meeting these Christian peers, and she started learning about Jesus at school. She started going with her friends to church, and before she graduated, she was baptized. And that's our main goal, but we disguise it in vocational training, and. It's not required. The Holy Spirit does all the work. We don't have to. This is our campus. We have our own property now. Um, 
and that's amazing. We had our first students in 2016. It's just me and Lawrence. It's just me, and then we've got a board, and you know, it's amazing. God provides. That's the most fun thing is God always provides. We'll send all our money for the budget. We have money the next month. It's amazing. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I did not even know what the desires of my heart were. I had no idea I had a desire for young people in Africa. My worldly desires, I had a clue, but I didn't even know. We do have mission, short-term mission trips come over. Um, last year in January, we had an eyeglass ministry that we partnered with a group out of Ann Arbor, and it was amazing success. People walked for miles. And so we're going to do that again this January. If you're feeling a tug at your heart, it's God speaking to you, whether you're a sender or you're a goer. And then we have another one in May. We, our school in my area has May term, and so we have some young people that want to go, and we're going to teach first aid because the Good Samaritan idea is not a thing over there. So we want to help teach them how to take care of simple problems. If you go to the doctor or the hospital there, they won't treat you unless you put the money up front. Call the ambulance, they might be out of gas, most likely. So to teach some first aid is a huge thing that we take for granted. A lot of things we take for granted. So I do, like Pastor John said, I have some newsletters, some brochures, some items that our tailors have made. If you want to just chat, I, I love to talk about it. So thank you so much for the warm welcome. Jeff, come on up too. Uh, Jeff is, you know, chief bottle washer, roadie, supporter, transporter, encourager, sender, of that. I don't know anybody else who would want to come up and, and lay hands on him as we pray, or you can just extend your hand from, from the uh, computer. So let's, let's pray for them. Mighty God, we, we do give you thanks for the, the way you show us what the desires of our heart are. And Lord, I, I thank you for Patty and for Jeff, Lord, and their willingness to, to say yes and not even knowing what that's going to mean. And, uh, but you do. And that you empower them to uh, encounter these things and to, to trust in you in ways they never, perhaps, ever imagined. But, but we thank you, Lord, for their willingness. And we thank you for uh, the continued ministry of Next Life Foundation ministry in the boonie and Lord bless all those bless, bless um, Lawrence and all the ministry he does there and all the work that they're uh, doing even now and, and uh, thank you for those opportunities that you put before each of us whether it's clear across the planet or right next door to our neighbors uh, but continue to bless Patty and Jeff continue to strengthen them continue to uh, resolve in their hearts the things that, that they, they may have questions about continue to um, give them the, the confidence in your day-to-day -day provision, uh, health-wise, finance-wise, prayers, things that are needed as you continue to, to find those next lives uh, in Laguni through their ministry. Lord, continue to help those young ones uh, learn new skills and learn uh, new relationships and have new friendships and especially uh, the way you, Holy Spirit, move to, to bring them into relationship with you. And, uh, for all that you are about, Lord God, and the precious blessing we get to be a part of in some way. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We continue our worship with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our life.
most merciful God, we confess that apart from Christ, we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and now by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on you his Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 
one who could save, the only one who did save. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that calls us and gathers us together this day to worship you and to give you all the thanks and praise. May we be once again filled and, and empowered to live life in your name among those who you call us to, among those who we've never met before, among dear friends and family, that we can shine brightly with the love that you have first given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. A first reading is from Galatians chapter five, verses one through fourteen. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Somebody has set a trap for me. That's what I was saying, Isaiah. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me or is there any other rock? I know of none. Psalm 119, verses 73 through 8. Your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see me and be glad, because I wait for your word. I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. O oh, may your loving kindness comfort me, according to your word to your servant. May your compassion come to me that I may live. For your law is my delight. May the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie. For your, oh, sorry. But I shall meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, even those who know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, so that I will not be ashamed. And now the verses I teased you with in Galatians. <laughs> It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For though for we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who were troubling you would even mutilate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here are the readings. <laughs>
Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning at the 44th verse. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. The Gospel of the Lord. Yes. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Can I invite any kids? Come on down. Awake, alive, and well. Full of them and bigger. Not awake, but full of them and bigger. That's good. Fast and to the point. I'm going to teach you, uh, teach you a couple signs. You probably already know something. So, what do you think that's a sign for? G and why do you think that? Why do you think that would be a sign for Jesus? You just know? Okay. Well, what do you, what do you think? That, why would we point to his hands? The, hole, yeah, the holes in his hands, right? The nails, right? To Jesus. So, it's really kind of cool that that became the sign for Jesus, right? So, let's do, do that together with me, will you? So, Jesus. So, say Jesus. 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 And do the sign. Jesus. And you guys can do it together. And <laughs> another sign I'm going to teach you is saved. So you do this first like you got ropes around your wrists. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you do that? So like you're bound, you're tied up. Saved. Saved. That's kind of cool too, right? Saved is like we're set free. Set free. We're set free. So Jesus yeah. saves. And then the third sign, Jesus saves. Because he is our Savior. Oh. Yes. All right, so let's try that. Jesus, Jesus saves save. because Jesus, Jesus is our Savior. Okay. So here's the challenge. During the message that we're going to give in just a minute, Karen and I, whenever you hear the name Jesus, we just do this. Right? We'll, we'll try to do it too, maybe, whatever time. And then whenever you hear the word saves or sets free, what are you going to do? What would, would you do? You pick it up. Or if you wake up, right? <laughs> right? And whenever you hear the word Savior, what's that one? Savior. All right. It'll help. It'll help a lot. Okay? Let's pray. Jesus, we are so glad that you are our Savior. And you come to set us free. And Holy Spirit, just come and have your way in us today. Help us believe it even more than we've ever believed it before and continue to root it deep down in our hearts about how much you love us. And we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Amen. I'll say it. Jesus. Jesus. Say. 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 Little, little, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Help us out. Karen and I would greatly appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be walking through those verses that it was so great, Tammy. You really emphasized our key verse today from Galatians uh, chapter 5. So we're going to be walking through those verses in Galatians 5. And we begin a new uh, theme today. We've been talking about, since Pentecost at least, as the Holy Spirit's been poured out upon us. That's the birthday of the church. Remember that Pentecost back in the end of May? And we've been, been really focused on what the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit works, how the Holy Spirit empowers us. Uh, in a lot of different ways. We've talked about how the Holy Spirit empowers us to even believe. The only, the only reason you're here today is because the Holy Spirit's been at work in your heart and in your life and in your mind. Uh, whether we've known it or been aware of it or not or those moments we become aware of it, right? Um, but the Holy Spirit empowers us to believe. The last few weeks we focused on the Holy Spirit empowers us to love, right? We talked about, we went through Paul's uh, love chapter in, in the 13th chapter of Corinthians about the love of uh, that God has for us and how that love is empowered. It's, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit uh, to love the way uh, God loves us. And as Karen finished up last week, you know, the greatest of these things uh, that we get to do and be a part of in this world is to love others the way God 
as first love does. So now we move into how the Holy Spirit empowers us to live our lives, right? Because now it's down to the nitty gritty of how does that look and what is that, uh, what shape does that take and how does that uh, kind of get formed in our lives? And this morning it's being empowered to live in freedom. And that's where our text uh, from Galatians uh, starts up here. So first we have to just root it back to sin, right? Every Sunday we confess that we are in bondage to sin. So first of all, we need freedom from something. We are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. So it's not something that we can do on our own. In fact, it's something that we see God has a plan for, a bigger story for, all the way back in Genesis. He talks about the, the sun, the seed, crushing the head of the serpent, right? That was Jesus predicted. He put this whole plan in motion because God desires for you to be saved, for you to be freed. <laughs> God, in his mercy and out of his love, offers us this free gift of salvation. Isn't that, wasn't that one? Yeah. Salvation. Okay. And when we accept this gift, we're given freedom in Christ. And that is not an identity that can be taken away from us. It's not really about being circumcised or uncircumcised or being Jews or Gentiles. It's about being in Christ. Before this, we lived in bondage to the law, burdened and dead. But Jesus' perfect and holy sacrifice gave us this freedom. Those who are in Christ live in freedom, live in him. Those who are in Christ are freed from the punishment that our sin demands. We will never be condemned by God. Those who are in Christ are freed from the burdens that the law places upon us. Jesus accused the religious leaders, we talked about this about four weeks ago, of, of placing burdens upon the people. Someone after first service said that they pictured the yoke that the, the slavery and bondage of us to as just going in a circle. You don't have someone bearing that burden with you, and you're going nowhere fast. But with Jesus here, with the freedom that he offers, with the yoke that he gives us, we can take his burden upon us. It is easy and light and freeing, and he gives us that partnership with him. Because he leads, and we just have to follow, keep in step with him. Jesus secured our freedom, and we are free in him. That Galatians 5, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. It might be obvious, but it's worth saying, right? Who sets us free? Jesus, Jesus right, sets us free, right? We can't. Uh, Karen's already talked about it. Jesus is the one that sets us free in, in all those things, whatever those things may be, whether it's a secret sin or whether it's a frustrating attitude or whether it's uh, all the different things we get entangled with in this world that sin. Jesus comes to be with us and comes to set us free from the power that he can have over us. And it's his work alone to bear. We, we can't do it. And a lot of times we don't want to do it, right? When we're in the midst of that temptation, in the midst of that struggle, whatever it may be, we really aren't capable or ever were to free ourselves from it. But Jesus is, and he sits with us in the midst of that and comes to set us free. He sets us free by offering himself for us. He is the one in the, in the gospel text this morning, those, those short little parables about what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like someone who finds a treasure in a field. When he finds it, he hides it, he sells all that he has so he can buy the field. The treasure is you. The, 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 the person in that story is, is God searching for the treasure, and he finds it when he's discovered, when he finds us, when he brings us back into to himself, to the kingdom. Or the merchant in the fine pearl that's seeking the fine pearl. Jesus is the merchant. God is the merchant who is determined to find you. And when he does, he gives everything for you. He sells it all. He gives his life for us. Only Jesus did that. Only Jesus does that. He gives his life freely for us. And so that freedom that we have in Christ, when Paul says it is for freedom that Christ sets us free, we can't overlook that part or we get tangled up in a whole mess of stuff like the early church did in the church of Galatia with getting tangled up in all these other things, the law uh, tried to, 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 to sever them or break them away from the grace that comes through Christ. Which is why that Paul is writing this. There's something like leaven. It snuck in and infected or influenced the whole church. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump, remember? John Calvin actually wrote that, um, that human heart is a 
perpetual idol factory. And in the verses from Isaiah, in that whole chapter, it's about the folly and the ridiculousness of worshiping something that we create with our own hands. And yet that's what we do. That's what our condition is. And so the law's purpose is to reveal our own sinfulness. It's to reveal our own self-righteousness, thinking that we can earn it ourselves, that we can sit and determine which is righteous and which is unrighteous. Romans 3.20, through the law comes knowledge of sin. See, the law just exposes our sin nature. And then Romans 4.15, the law brings wrath because no one can keep it perfectly. You cannot keep the whole law. The law points to our need for a savior, our inability to save ourselves. The law cannot remove sin. It's not graded on a curve. And when we fall into following after the law and thinking the law will save us, we kind of fall into that way of thinking, of that comparison, thinking that we can sort out the wheat and the wheat and the fish from each other, thinking that if the guy next to me is going 10 miles an hour, it's okay that I go five miles an hour over the speed limit. Jesus redeemed us from the weight that the sin places upon us, that the law places upon us, the curse. He set us free from all of that. When he the Son sets free, it's free indeed. We're empowered to live in freedom in Christ, rooted in that identity in Christ that cannot be taken away from you, treasured pearls that you are. So we live without clinging to that past bondage, without, without going back to the obligations of the law, because for freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to that yoke of slavery. We live without returning to the past burdens that we carried, attempting to think that we could satisfy the law, or to the wrong thinking, thinking that we could earn our salvation or make our way ourselves, when Jesus is the only way and the truth and the life. But we live in the freedom and joy of being set free in him, being clothed in his righteousness. I'm picking up at verse 5. For, for we, through the Spirit by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working in love. And so who, who gets this freedom, by the way? Who, who has this freedom? Well, first of all, it's available to everyone. Going back to the gospel text, right? The dragnet, the kingdom of heaven is like the dragnet that's thrown into the sea and catches every kind fish. of fish. Yep. Now, we live in a world right now where we love to make people different kinds, mm. right? There's every kind, even the kinds we never imagined existed, yep. right? And it's so easy then to get on our self-righteous high horse and say, well, at least I'm not that kind. Right? I mean, come on. Don't, don't pretend. But the freedom that Christ came to give is for all kinds. Every kind is accepted and welcomed into the kingdom. And how does that happen? It happens by our believing and trusting in his work for us, not our own. Yeah, if we go, to, if we go before God and try to, to show our account, right, to show what we deserve or earn, how do you think that's going to compare to Jesus? But the beautiful part is, is we get to come to God with Jesus. Right? He's the one that we go to God together with. Every, every week we, we profess our faith in the Apostles' Creed, and we say it, you know, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And apart from Christ, that's, that's a terrifying prospect. But in Christ, and it's in Christ, not in ourselves, we have nothing to fear. Because we have been bought and purchased by Christ, that freedom is available to all, and it comes to us by faith. And if you remember, faith isn't something we generate by ourselves either, right? How does faith come? By the work of the Holy Spirit. So God, in this amazing determination to love us, right, puts everything in motion for it to take place. In fact, really, the only freedom we have apart from Christ is the freedom to reject God. But why would we? We do it a lot. Like Karen said, our, our hearts often are those idol factories. We worship and chase after all kinds of things. 
but that freedom is still available to us, and it's, it's coming to him and getting caught up in his dragon. I mean, it's really about not so much our inviting Christ into our hearts, it's the fact that Christ has invited us into his. We're invited into the kingdom of heaven. We're invited to be part of it. That's why Paul's so frustrated with the Galatians, right? They started out running well. They started out knowing this truth, and then they slowly started thinking, well, we need to add some things to Jesus. And Paul's saying, when we do that, we really cut ourselves off from that grace that's been so freely given to us. The freedom is available to all. It comes by faith, which is a work of the Holy Spirit. It comes when we say yes to God's yes in Jesus Christ. But what isn't freedom? So freedom isn't an excuse to sin. It isn't the right to sin. It isn't the ability to judge others indiscriminately. 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Because we have a loving God Maybe sometimes we think, he's so forgiving, it doesn't matter if I, I can get away with, I deserve a little. But we live as free servants of God. Some other verses even say slaves of God. And there is joy there, there is freedom there when we're linked, when we're yoked with him. Freedom is our status and identity in Christ. It's not our works, but our wonder, our joy, and our reaction at the completed work that he already accomplished. Galatians 5.13, for you were called into freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love to serve one another. Great joy and freedom are available to all who recognize that only Jesus sets us free. Free from being slaves of ourselves, free from being slaves of sin, free from being slaves to the law, and welcomed into abundant life in him. Knowing that everything first comes from him. In his word, we learn, like we see repeated through Psalm 119. In his strength, we stand firm. In his righteousness, we are clothed. In his sacrifice, we are set free. And in his love, we then love others. So then the question, how do we live in freedom? How do we live with all this amazing gift that God has given to us, this freedom, this, this righteous, this right standing that we have with God, no longer under the burden of the law? And like Karen shared, like Paul writes, right? It doesn't mean that just because God's grace abounds doesn't mean we get to just sin abound, right? Uh, which is what we would tend to do apart from Christ. But now, how do we get to live? Paul gives us two instructive words here. He says, you stand firm and you eagerly wait. And they sound like things at two opposite ends of the spectrum, to stand firm and eagerly wait. But to stand firm is to stand firm in Christ. It's not to stand firm in my goodness, and I did better good today than, better good, I did more, more good today <laughs> than yesterday. It's not standing in my own sense of, of Achieving or succeeding in the day, standing firm in what Christ has accomplished. I was sharing with Karen yesterday, you know, so often we, our first greeting to people are, how are you? And I wonder if it should be, who are you? A chance to remind one another who we are in Christ in spite of how we might be feeling or what might be happening in the moment or the circumstances. It's not to ignore the circumstance, but we never want to forget who we are in spite of the circumstances. That in spite of sin often winning the day, Christ remains our faithful Savior. Right? Our sin can't dismiss that. Our sin can't do away with the fact that in Christ we are set free. And even though while sometimes in this world we don't see that freedom looking very good to us because of our condition or maybe where we're at with things. But standing firm in Christ, and be reminded, that's why we come to worship to be reminded of who we are so that we can live in that freedom. And then to eagerly wait. Is this is what we get to do until the second coming, until Christ returns and takes us home, is we get to do things like that. We get to go on a short-term mission trip that's now turned into a lifetime calling. But we don't have to go to Tanzania to, to be transformed that way. Many of us, many of you who worked in the schools, you were youth ministers, whether you knew it or not. 
Those of you who do other kinds of volunteering and serving in your community, you're, you're eagerly waiting for his coming as you love others in Christ. Those of you who work in factories or as engineers or whatever, there, there's nothing that Christ can't transform into a ministry, right? I love that. The, the vocational ministry is kind of the means and the aim is the heart, like Sahara discovered when she came and Christ grabbed a hold of her. You see, the, the way we live is we live in Christ, or as Paul would say later in Galatians, it's, it's really Christ alive in you living out his life through us. Paul would say, we've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives where? In me. So we say yes, we, we understand that, that, that salvation and that freedom doesn't come from our own doing, it's Christ's work for us, and then we eagerly wait with hope and anticipation for Christ's coming. And we do it in confidence. We don't do it hoping and wishing, I heard, hope he up, comes back before I screw it all up again. <laughs> No, we eagerly wait in the midst of even screwing up at times for the Christ who comes and declares the completion of his work in us and through us for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Mighty God, there's so much more that, that are in these texts and so much more that you'll speak in our hearts through your spirit. Your, your spirit works in the proclamation of the word, and so we're grateful for that. And we pray this morning, Lord, as we continue our worship of you, singing your praises as we lift up our prayers to you as we profess our faith, as we come to the table and, and again receive your mercy and grace in our times of need, that we would continue to be a people in whom your peace that passes all understanding guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand with me as we continue our worship with the singing of our next song, which is on the screen today. It is well with my soul. Thank you.
join me as we profess our Christian faith in the word of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Mighty God, we do thank you that, as we just sang, in the midst of all that the world would attempt to throw at us in the struggles of our own flesh, of the assaults of the enemy, Lord God, that in Christ all is well. That we find our hiding place and our abiding place in Christ. And that in him there is no shame, there's no condemnation. We have been set free from the law of sin and death and brought to life again in Christ Jesus. Father God, may that identity just continue to just permeate every part of our lives, our thoughts, our actions, our attitudes. By the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, may you reveal to us those places that continue to be in need of your, your saving work and your redeeming work. That as we take your yoke upon us that is light and easy, as we, as we remember and are reminded through your word and through the words of other believers, Lord, that we are that precious pearl. We are that treasured pearl that you have sought after and acclaimed. And that we can never be separated from the love, your love in Christ Jesus, and not height nor depth or anything else. So may we live as those kind of people in the world this week. Father God, we live in a world where nations are at war natural disasters wreak havoc. Highways become places of rage and accidents. And you are the God that continues to be with us and to sustain us and care for us. And so may we be generous in our, our living and loving others this week. May we remember that we are one of those every kind of fish that you've caught into the dry net of your kingdom of heaven. May we rejoice as others are as well. May we learn to grow up in you. Father God, thank you for the many ministries around the world and, and close at home where we thank you for the ministries of Next Life Foundation and Uganda Medical Mission. And this week we especially lift up the ministries of family promise and all those who are able and willing to serve this week, their families that come to us. May we see those, those amazing opportunities to stand firm and eagerly wait for the freedom we have in Christ to love generously, to give of ourselves, our time, and our possessions. And Father, thank you too that we come to your throne of grace and mercy to find grace and mercy in times of need. That with confidence we can lift up the names of those who are in need of healing and hope, encouragement, comfort, and strength. Trusting that you are already miles ahead in working out and bringing good even from the most dire of situations. And so we praise you and pray for those this morning in our congregation for Burl Carlisle, Carlisle. Pam Kirky, yeah. Becky Fagg, <laughs> Jim Cutler, Don Risley, Bernice Wilson, Bernice Wilson, Bernice Wilson Jerry Bittner, Dave Pollard, Judy Halone, Mary Button, Margie Hill, Andy Dyson, Connie Mitchell, Sandy Scott, Luke Snyders, Chuck and Jan Summers, Sharon Alexander, Ivan Pleyev, and others we name either aloud or in our hearts. In 
into your hands, O oh Lord. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Please take some time and share that peace with us.
now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join me as we sing our sending hymn, number 559, Over a Thousand Tongues of Sea.